Good morning, beautiful people. It's Wake Up in the Den. I'm Kule Agbayani alongside Paul Brex. We've got a fun show for you. The return, it is summer, so you know what we do in the summer. We start filling the studio with special guests. And to kick off the summer, we got the one, the only University of Hawaii assistant basket, men's basketball coach, Brad Davidson. Woo! Woo! Thanks good for having morning. me. Yeah, good to be here in the den. Yes. How are you doing today? Thank you for making the time during the summer. No problem. Anything for you. You know that. <laughs> Love to hear it. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. If you guys uh, are new to our series where we have our in-studio guests, usually we just spend the time getting to know them first before we get into their sports uh, specifically and the programs that they coach. So, Brad, first things first, just tell everybody about where you're from in case no one could tell that you do have an accent by now. <laughs> yes, my Australian accent usually uh, tips off everybody from where I'm from. So from Australia. Um, been out in the U.S. now for eight years, so going into year nine uh, with my family of uh, my wife and three kids. Um, we've had a bit of an adventure out here so far through the, the Dakotas and then out to beautiful Hawaii for the last three years. Okay, so take us back to your uh, hometown is listed as Mullumbimby. I think I said that right, <laughs> in New South Wales, Australia. So tell us a little about, uh, try to explain ge geographically where that is on the map or maybe how far it is from somewhere like Sydney, where a lot of people are familiar with, and a little bit about your hometown. Yeah, so well done in saying Mullumbimby to start off with. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of a joke even with my friends back in Australia, but um, <laughs> it, it's really close to the most easterly part of Australia. It's close to Brisbane. Uh, it's about two hours drive from Brisbane, and it's about an eight-hour drive from Sydney. Um, it's a, it's a coastal town, um, you know, really close to Byron Bay, as I said, which is, uh, a lot like Hawaii, um, beautiful beaches, great surfing, uh, really good weather. So, um, being in Hawaii has been a little bit like that, um, you know, being like home for me. And what are some of the go-to food? So Brad was very kind. He brought some chocolate that is very, I guess, popular in Australia for us today that we will try. Even though I was you curious what that yeah. was. Tim Tam chocolate. Yeah, so, so Tim, Tim Tams are the uh, kind of the uh, biscuit of choice, I guess we would call it. Um, it's chocolate covered uh, wafer and uh, delicious with uh, coffees, teas, whatever you like. Or a snack. And uh, Bernardo De Silva said that he cannot just have one. If he has one of these, he <laughs> eats the whole packet. So that, that's his deal. I'm glad Bernardo and I are one in the same then in, in some senses because I, I can't really control myself with like any real good sweet like that. So what it, it sounds incredible. So I'm glad I'm glad I'm not alone at least. Yeah, I was gonna, I was going to say, hey, we should open this during our break. But never mind if we're going to keep eating it. Then maybe we should not do that. That sounds kind of dangerous. I, I was telling Koo that I use the Tim Tam packets. You can actually buy them here in Hawaii. Like you couldn't buy them anywhere on the mainland that I, I use them as a thank you for people that do good things for us at uh, UH. <laughs> okay. I, I know if I've overextended asking somebody for a favor that they'll uh, they'll get some Tim Tams after that. Hey, there we go. Like so you can do some like favor it. and you'll get some as well. All right. So going back to uh, tell us a little bit about your childhood and growing up in Australia. Yeah, a very sporting childhood. Uh, I started out, I really wanted to play Australian rules football. And um, you know, Marte Cellina, who was on our team, mm -hmm. who now plays Australian rules football, is living my dream <laughs> of what I wanted to do. So I uh, grew up playing a lot of different sports, cricket which is, um, you know, Australia's baseball, I guess. Um, yeah, all, all different types of sport. And then I moved, we, we actually moved to Mullumbimby when I was 10 and uh, I couldn't play Australian rules football anymore. So I started playing basketball and uh, it 
kind of developed a passion for it that's now gone for the next 40 years of my life. <laughs> and hey, there's been a lot of talent that has come out of Australia as well. So tell us about some of the uh, players that maybe U.S. fans might be familiar with that you were able to work with. Yeah, I, I was really lucky. I, I played professionally for, for 13 years in our uh, domestic competition there and, and then with our Australian team. So I got to be around a lot of really good players and, and coaches. But uh, some of the guys that were coming through, uh, Joe Ingalls, who, who now plays for Orlando, has had a good NBA career. He was he was coming through. Uh, I played against him. I've got some nice clips of, of me scoring on him yeah. that, that, yeah. that I'll, that I'll send go. to him every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would do the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like Andrew Bogut, Patty Mills, uh, Matthew Della Vadova, that, that was kind of the era that was coming through as, as I was finishing my, my time playing. And you were a point Ooh. guard, right? I was a point guard, an, an angry shooting point guard. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What, what was it kind of like to, you said they came through towards the end of your, your tenure of playing. What was it kind of like to watch uh, Australia make that rise towards the top of the, the FIBA world rankings and whatnot? We've seen them really have some great runs in both the Olympics, the World Cup, and, and so on and so forth, or the basketball. And we, we've seen them be a real powerhouse in basketball. What has it been like to watch them grow the game or watch the game grow even further there? Obviously, the United States for a long time seemed to have a, a grip on the, the international competition. And then all, Australia, really, they almost echoed it at times. The... The Australian team's always been quite strong. Like we'd had some fourth place finishes in World Cups and, and Olympics, but th there was always such a difference between where the US was, probably where a, like a, a Yugoslavia, uh, you know, that that those teams that were coming through, uh, Lithuania were really good. There, there was probably a gap and, and it has been really cool to see Australia come through now. And, and I think some of it has been um, our guys coming over and, and playing in college and then going into the NBA. I think some of it has been, uh, you know, like Joe did a different route. He played in the Australian competition and then went to Europe and, and then came out and got cut by the Clippers and then got picked <laughs> up by the Jazz. Like Everyone's had a, a bit of a different path to it. But I, I do think uh, the guys going into the NBA and, and now they're not scared of coming over and playing the best players in the world. And I think that's, that's happened for all the international teams. You, you know, look at Luca and mm -hmm. Slovenia and those guys coming through as well. Like it, it's just really changed how uh, global the NBA has become. Mm -hmm. And take us back to your time as a player. You told us that you'll send videos uh, <laughs> every now and then to remind people you played with, but uh, do you have any like specific favorite or a couple of favorite memories as a player during your professional time? Yeah, I uh, we made a finals one time. We had a, an injury during the year, and I, I was coming off the bench at, at that time. And I ended up coming into the starting lineup, and we won a, a you know eleven games in a row and made the finals and and won our regular season and ended up making the the finals for a, a small town that ma had made the finals for the first time. So we had this town of uh, called Townsville of uh, one hundred and fifty thousand people and competing against the the biggest cities of Sydney and Melbourne, and Adelaide and Perth. And uh, we ended up making it to game three of the finals. I unfortunately fouled out with uh, eight minutes to go. We were up eight. Um, Conspiracy was in. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I thought you was... said you were an angry shooter, not <laughs> you were angry. I was very angry then when that, that, that <laughs> sixth foul came through. But, uh, just to see a way a, a community rallied around a team uh, was a really cool experience for me. It kind of put me on the map. So that was a, a, you know, one of the big moments for my career. And then playing for my country. I got to play for our uh, Boomers for, for two years and my final um, competition with the Boomers was uh, Commonwealth Games, which is kind of like an Olympic Games for the Commonwealth countries. And it was in Melbourne and having my Ooh. family there. We ended up winning the gold medal for that. So that was a, a really big moment moment for me. And I, I was getting old at that stage. And unfortunately, after that uh, tournament, the next uh, camp we had was for the World Cup and I got injured just before it and they brought in a, a player to replace me for the camp and that person ended up uh, being a 14 year NBA uh, player named Patty Mills. So as I was sitting there watching the team uh, 
practice and, and run around the court and Paddy jumped in there and I, I saw him run up and down the court a few times. I thought, yep, my time over, <laughs> my time is done. Oh, no. I'm done. And, uh, it, you know, obviously really proud of how well he's done, but that was, uh, <laughs> the, I ended up going into a, a room with the coach you know, the next day and he walked in, he just looked at me and nodded his head. We both knew what was going on. I gave him a hug, a, a little cry. He thanked <laughs> me for my time at this Australian team and then, and then now Patty's gone on to to do a lot better than what I ever would have done. <laughs> That's crazy that you got to that because that was actually going to be my next question. I'm like, <laughs> when did you know that your professional time was done? And well, at least at least you were accepting of it in a sense, like, well, openly accepting. I'm sure inside it was still if anyone's career like that is going to come to an end. Of course, there's going to be some heartbreak, some struggle to get over. But I mean, it, at least there was no debate because <laughs> sometimes you're like, hey, I can. I can still outplay this player, but when Patty Mills came in, you're, you're like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> My favorite, I have a, I always remember Shaq telling the story of when he knew he was, it was time to retire was like, he was in the paint and he pump faked and kept pump faking and nobody would bite on the pump fake. And he was like, okay, maybe it's time. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody believes in that. And in that sense, like that, you have to make that call. Oh, I can't. Seeing Patty Mills uh, right at the start then, right? That's so yeah. cool. That's got to be a cool transition, even if it's a little bittersweet at the end. <laughs> it, it, it is cool because he he obviously lives out here in the, the off season. So, and he'll come in and work out with our guys and our guys get to watch him and uh, just to see where he's come. So like, he, I don't think at the time he knew he would had taken the spot that I'd had. But uh, yeah, over time, and, and I've got a chance to coach with the Australian team to watch him. It's, it's been really cool for me. Yeah, and we are joined by UH Men's Basketball Assistant Coach Brad Davidson. Before we go to break, though, and we're talking about it, how you played 13 years in the top division in Australia, but also in the player highlights, because I know you won't talk about yourself, but uh, ranked one of the NBL's all, all-time best shooters with more than 600 career three-pointers and a 40.1% career mark from behind the arc. Hey, yo. Yeah, well, I'm not very tall. Uh, I was kind of fast, but not super athletic. So I had to do something well. And I, I knew if I was g going to stay and do what I wanted to do, that I had to get really good at shooting. So that became my thing. What do you think it was? Like, what is maybe, uh, I know it's hard to describe any type of advice you would give to a shooter, but if you could, what is something that you would describe, like techniques that worked for you to become a good shooter? Uh, I, I really like going to camps and trying to trying to better myself. So I, I wanted to be coached by every different person. So I would try and pick up each, you know, something from each person. Uh, I was, I really loved basketball. So I watched a lot of basketball. I listened and it was obviously a, a long time ago. So it was before YouTube and uh, anything was around, but trying to get to camps and I'd watch anything. The NBA would be on it at, at 2 a.m. on a Friday night in Australia one game a week and I'd sit and I'd listen to the commentary and talk about, you know, how people shot and what different techniques and footwork and all that sort of stuff. So I, I really tried to become, I guess, a student of the game and, and that helped me. I feel like we need to have a shooting competition between the three of us in here. All right, we got a mini hoop. Might be kind of even, okay. I think. We, I we mean, Paul, the, Paul was a point guard as well. I was a two guard slash small forward. So, but I, I couldn't right dribble, here, so. but I could shoot. So maybe it, it might be kind of even if it's just a shooting contest. I don't know. I got to get in shape first, but I, I, I don't know. I don't think I could get to the basket from behind the arc. I, but. I feel like this might be a setup. No, no. It's, 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 oh, my goodness. Never. Us. Never. No, no, never that. Uh, that'd be fun, though. Who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll set up some fun. It's the summertime. We got to set up fun content ideas for everybody. Uh, you know, we'll find we'll find some time. Yeah. So, but we got to take a, our first break of the day. We are joined by UH Men's Basketball Assistant Coach Brad Davidson. If you guys have any questions for Brad, you can text us at 808-888-KGU1. That's 808-888-5481. But we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. This is Wake Up in the Den. more wake up in the den with kukule agbayani on the hawaii sports radio network 95.1 fm and am 760 
Welcome back to Wake Up in the Den. Kule Agbayani, Paul Brecht, and joined in studio for the entire hour, UH Men's Basketball Assistant Coach Brad Davidson. We're getting to know Coach Brad just a little bit before we get into the specific University of Hawaii Men's Basketball talk and answer some of your questions. So be sure to text us at 808-888-KGU1, 808-888-5481. All right. We talked a lot about your time in Australia and where, where you're originally from and growing up and your professional career there. Um, and then, uh, as you kind of joked about during the break from Australia, uh, you came to the U.S. and straight into minus 30 degrees and North Dakota as an assistant coach was your first uh, job here in the United States. So tell us about what made you want to make that move and how that all transpired. So I'd been coaching for Basketball Australia. They have a uh, high school set up where all, all the NBA guys just about have gone through. Um, and th they'll get those guys there from 16 to 18 years old. So college coaches are coming through there all the time, trying to get these guys to come out and, and play college. And uh, a friend of mine that I'd played with uh, was recruiting and he came out and he had a job open up in North Dakota. And our kids were young and we, we'd be, talking about, you know, do we stay in Canberra at the, the center of excellence or, or do we think about doing something else? And my wife, who is a world traveler, a global citizen, I call her, who's kind of lived all <laughs> over the country, uh, all over the world, said, well, the kids are young, like maybe this is something we should think about doing now. So uh, that went to, well, Brian's got a job at North Dakota, should we do that? And we didn't really know where North Dakota was, obviously. And, uh, we, fair, we fair, <laughs> fair. I mean, I'm from the United States, I guess, and I don't know where North Dakota is, so I, I get it. We, we joke that we do always do the uh, road less traveled than, than everybody else. So, uh, yeah, we packed the, the three kids up and moved to, to North Dakota. And as, as you said, it was just completely different. You know, we went from one of the colder towns in Australia to something that we had never experienced before. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were there for a couple of years, but then you go south and then you go to South Dakota. So tell us a little about, bit about why you went from North Dakota <laughs> to South Dakota. Yeah, we, we sort of decided it was time for another change and we thought we'd go all the way to South Dakota, <laughs> um, which is actually a, a fair distance between where the schools were. So um, it was like a six and a half hour drive. So it, it's more than just a a drive over the state lines. Um, there was a new coach going to South Dakota and we, we felt like that was a, a good move for us. And um, yeah, it was in a different conference and yeah, just something we thought was the best thing for us at the time. Yeah. How was the overall um, just cultural adjustment for you and your family? It, it, we, uh, my wife and I met when I was playing, uh, we met in Singapore when I was playing there. She'd been working there. You know, we, we've moved around. So uh, it's something that we've always wanted to do and have our kids experience. And uh, we, th we just felt like it was an adventure for us. So we were kind of living through an adventure of basketball and college sports and, you know, being the only Australian accents in a, in a town or <laughs> felt like a state at times. But, you know, you know, my wife, as I said, likes to travel. So we were doing trips here, here and there in our time off. So we, we treated it as an adventure and the cultural aspect for it has been amazing for us and, and, for, for the kids as well. Uh, I, I'm curious as well, just for the matter, or matter of, you were making the shift from being a head coach to an assistant coach too during this time, right? At, when you came over to originally North Dakota. What was that kind of transition like for your career, for your personal development? Was it difficult at all to go from being the head guy to being a group of voices was were you already used to that from you know your time both playing and coaching what was that adjustment like was it an adjustment as as a type a personality it is adjustment um and as i, I joke around angry point but like the leadership part of being a point guard um just kind of i guess came naturally to me and and you're ready to organize people so being a head like i went straight from playing to being a head coach in the second division in australia so uh, yeah, coming and being an assistant, it, but um, it, it, it is different, but at the same time, it's basketball and you're helping and it, it makes you understand, like you can sit next to a head coach now and understand what he's going through, you know, that you get stressed at times <laughs> and you might take it out on your assistants <laughs> or, the, or, the, or the players. So, so I can sit there and, and um, you know, re really help, I guess, the head coach because I know what he's, he's been through. Um, the, the really good thing about the Australian system with coaching is – 
you can coach, uh, you can be the head coach of an under 16 team, under 18 team, a state team who, who is really good. And, and then you can go and be an assistant for a higher level. And then you can go to a camp where you're doing player development. So there's a real holistic approach to it where I feel like in, in the U S you, you will be, you know, like a director of operations and then you'll go to being an assistant you might become a head coach without actually calling a timeout <laughs> where, where I'd, I'd been through that whole process. So I, I do feel like the holistic approach to how they do it in Australia, which is different, but um, and coming over here has helped me navigate my way through different scenarios of, of running an offense, of taking play development sessions to, to dealing with administrations, to helping a head coach. Yeah. Five tool players, cool. Five tool players. And actually, <laughs> sorry, I do want to go back because I just uh, noticed that little, uh, you know, couple of years as you, uh, a shooting coach and talent identification manager, like that's pretty cool. In in between your coaching stints, like a couple head coaching gigs in Australia, another one before you come to be an assistant in the U.S. But what exactly did you do for that? And that that's actually kind of sounds like a fun job because you just get to watch basketball like all the time, huh? <laughs> yeah, it, it was a, a really cool job. And uh, I would go to our um national championships and try and uh, identify who should come into our high school program. So it's, you're sitting there and you're trying to find the next Joe Ingalls, Patty Mills, and you're trying to predict forward years of who could help us with our um, national team and trying to win a gold medal and an Olympic. So that, that was always the aim. The, the cool thing about that was uh, we were based in Canberra at the Australian Institute of Sport where all the Olympic um, programs are. So I could go and talk to the national swimming coach about what they do with talent ID, recovery, uh, you know, uh, uh, sports science. Uh, I could go and talk to the Australian soccer coach. I could talk to the, uh, we had a cycling team came through that was getting ready for the world championships. And there was four guys there that had done the tour de France and <laughs> they asked me to do a team building. With, so you, you're getting to deal with all these uh, different sports and understand, you know, what, what's important with coaching, what's important with uh, looking after the athletes, what's important with recovery and administration. You, it, once again, it's the, the holistic part of, of running a program yourself. Um, you know, you, you could get things from different sports that were, which was really cool, really cool experience. Yeah. And you have that eye. Paul missed this story earlier because he had stepped out before we jumped on air, but uh, yeah, tell everybody about the most recent uh, you thinking a player has talent and he ended up going to Kansas and now he's staying in the NBA draft. Yeah, I think I can use his name because he's staying in the NBA draft yeah. now. So he's, he's, yeah. he's yeah. no longer. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Akira Jacobs was based at the Center of Excellence where I used to work uh, at the NBA, the NBA Global Academy now is is based there. So they, they've they used that program in Australia to, to um, facilitate a lot of the players from countries that don't have those facilities there or that or that environment. So Akira, who plays for us, was there and I was scouting. I was watching all these games. I was like, wow, this kid, Johnny Furf, he's, he's gotten really good. He's gotten good. And the more I watched, um, yeah, you could tell he, he was turning into something special. And uh, we went to an international competition and the, the head of scouting, uh, Jonathan Giovanni for ESPN, who, who does all the, the mm -hmm. stuff for them, I was talking to him. I was like, you got to look out for Johnny Furphy. He's coming. And he's like, I've seen, I saw him six months ago. Yeah, he's okay. And, and then I said, no, he's, he's made a move. And we, we went to this tournament in Atlanta last year and, and Johnny Furphy blew up and went to Kansas. And now yeah, <laughs> within 18 months, it, you could see, but it, like I could also tell because I'd been through, you know, I'd watched the games and, and been through that environment where, where he was headed. He's a Nick. By the way, <laughs> everyone is going to be. A he's, he's a Nick. Pick number 24. You are. <laughs> it's funny. I wanted you to tell that story just because I feel like in this studio, we're all, especially when it comes to basketball, we're all about like the eye test. Like there's yeah. like stats say one thing, but it's something about when you watch basketball and you watch basketball players, you just kind of know. Like there's just some, something about them always stands out. You got to yeah. feel for them a lot of times. Uh, when, and statistics matter, obviously. Yeah. You need the production, but. Kind of like you said, and and I'm curious if you feel this too, because you probably have a better <laughs> feel on, you know, doing talent identification and recruiting and so on and so forth, where it's just, it's, uh, the, the eye test is important. You need to have some sort of eye popping standout skill or, or whether it's something step, right yeah. cerebral, whether it's quick step, whether it's your shooting touch. You know, you need something that jumps out to the eye, even just to grab attention. And then you dive deep, like deeper into it. 
Is that a fair way to go about talent evaluation a lot of times? How do you go about it? Yeah, I think you've got it. I think you got to, you should be looking at the NBA for uh, working out how we can get Paul into, onto a team. <laughs> hey, 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 uh, no, no, we, we need him here. We need him here. <laughs> no, no, it's true. It, it's, and the NBA has unlimited resources and get it wrong all the time. <laughs> So, so it's not an exact science and, and you can do the same th- thing here in, in college. You, you're dealing with young adults that are, f- are finding their way through. And it, it is, it, it, once again, you know, I've used the word holistic a few times. You, you're looking at, at everything. Are there, um, you know, advanced stats from their games that they've played? Uh, does that, you know, survive the eye test of, of what you're doing? You know, is it against the right competition? How is he getting his shots? Does this work for how we play? Like there, there is so much more to it than looking at it and go, oh, that guy had 30 points. He must be really good. Uh, we, we do a lot of stuff on percentages, you know, like rebounding is one thing for basketball that, mm-hmm. that really translates through all divisions. Like you've, we've seen some kids that have come through from a division two school and you, look, you say, well, he's going against smaller players or not as athletic and they'll come to Division One, and that translates through. So th- there is some things that translate and, and there's some that aren't, but you need to use the stats and your eyes and experience and under- also understand that you got to get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It, yeah. yeah it's, it's, like you said, not an exact science, and we've seen it time and time again. We are joined by UH men's basketball assistant coach Brad Davidson in studio today, but we got to take a break. When we come back, we will completely switch gears and talk all about University of Hawaii basketball next on the Hawaii Sports Radio Network. The OIA lives here. Relive the winning moments and listen to games on demand. Go to hawaiisportsradio.com and click on the OIA Sports tab. Wake up in the den with Kuwale Agbiani on the Hawaii Sports Radio Network, 95.1 FM and AM 760. Welcome back to all of you, the beautifulest of all the beautiful people. It's Wake Up in the Den alongside DJ Pauly B. I'm Kule Agbayani, and we are joined in studio by University of Hawaii men's basketball coach Brad Davidson. All right, talked a lot uh, for the first half of the show about just your journey, where you're from in Australia, and now you're coming over here. We mentioned how you started coaching in the U.S. at North Dakota, then South Dakota, and that was till 2021, and then you find yourself here at the University of Hawaii. So tell us about um, just how that process went, and I'm assuming it was wasn't a hard decision to decide, decide to apply for the, <laughs> the job opening. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, I, I, knew I knew Iran, Iran from, my from my time in Australia, Australia. so he was coming out as well, as well recruiting players. players. So it was, um, um, yeah, yeah, an, an easy choice. choice. We'd been friends for all that time. We'd see each other on the road, and and I had said to him previously, if if you call me, I'm I'm in. So they had role come up. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, was it a good time for us, for us so, so we decided, decided to, to head, head out of here. Yeah, but it wasn't a hard decision to, to come to Hawaii. To Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm sure it wasn't that hard for, like, like your wife and your kids, kids to be like, oh, no, no we, we don't want to go there, there to Hawaii. Hawaii. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting because when, when the, the, the kids have their own little friends group and everything, so it was hard for them to move. But, yeah, once we got out here and jumped in the pool and went to the beach on the weekends and they realized they didn't have to put their snow gear on in the middle of winter, they were that was, that was pretty, pretty heavy. This isn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right so, so we're here, and, and then uh, obviously, obviously it's kind of the, the I guess, I guess the, the aftermath of dealing, dealing with like the pandemic, pandemic and, everything, and everything and whatnot. whatnot but uh, and, uh, then and then it's kind of the start of this, this whole NIL, NIL landscape that we find, find ourselves in. So talk to us a little bit about how you have been handling that as a coach or just as the program in general, like really dealing with the almost like no rules situation that we have going on and um, how that affects the recruiting process. It's, it's interesting because, because I've, I've, I've played, I played 13 years. I had, uh, I actually, actually played for seven different, different uh, professional teams. teams. I've gone through the, through the, you know, the professional, professional route of contracts, contracts and, and everything. And it just feels like that now. Um, it felt like, uh, I would say even three years ago, you dealt with a high school coach or if someone was transferring, uh, you know, like the, the other coach, but you, you deal with a high school coach, the parents and the player. 
now uh, and then the next year it felt like you, you, you had to deal with um, the player with the NIL and now you're dealing with an agent and the high school coach has gone out. the way. So, so you're finding it a lot harder just to really get the right information on, on the kids. So um, it, it's just added extra layers to the recruiting process. So we, we talked about identification of talent. You can do that. And then, then you've got the next layer of, you know, what do they want to get out of it financially or if anything, and, and if that fits to where, where your program's at and how much you value those players. And that kind of brings us to some of our text messages that we, we got in so far with deals with recruiting. Uh, this text message coming out from a 619 area code. A uh, question for Coach Davidson. Why do we have five open scholarships so late in the recruiting process? Many prospects who have taken an OV to UH have gone to other schools. What are we lacking? I'm not sure it's it's what we're lacking. I, I just think we, we have brought some players out here that we've, uh, we hadn't had a chance to eyeball, I guess, during the process. So, um, so some of that is our doing and some of it is, is the players. And we, we also aimed high on a few guys that we've brought out on official visits. Uh, obviously, we'd like to have our team done right now. That would be, that would be good for us. But we're, we're also selective of, of who we're bringing in, and we, we still feel comfortable that we're in a, a good spot to land some of these last players that are coming in, and we're, we're really excited about the guys that, that are coming back. So we're, part of it has been um, yeah, us checking out the players a little more than, than usual. And the other part is we, ha we have aimed high with a couple of the guys we've brought on official visits. Uh, this is a positive text for the recent signings. Uh, this person coming from the uh, 722 or 808722, uh, the recent signings look very good. Do you, ha do you have any imminent commits or signings, any incoming visits? We hopefully have... Um, <laughs> So oh, yeah, obviously I know you can't tell us <laughs> entirely, but from what you can say, just so uh, everybody knows, there's only so much that the coaches and programs can release and information that they can say. But uh, so please don't don't take it out on Coach Brad <laughs> that he's like trying to be secretive. It's just if he says too much, it's against the rules and you just can't say. Uh, but so what you can share with us, please. Yeah, we're really hoping that we've got a few people at the moment where in the final stages of, of them making their decision. And once again, we've aimed high with these guys. So uh, it's t it takes a little longer with this. So we're, if we end up getting who we hope we get, we'll be very excited. And uh, the guys coming in, we're, we feel like we've hit, really hit a home run with, um, you know, the Aaron Clater who's coming in mm -hmm. has just got better and better through his senior year. And um, really nice to bring somebody home, you know, and... and you could see the excitement with them. And then the transfers that we've brought in, Marcus Green and, and Tanner Christensen, have both been proven Division One players and, and uh, will fill the two hardest spots to fill, uh, the point guard and center position. So, And, and then with the guys coming back. So uh, we're, we're really excited. And AJ Economou is also new well, new to the group, but he came halfway through the year, so we don't feel like he's, he's new. But we, <laughs> we've got to see him, and we're excited about where his career will go here as well. I I'm I know that I've been very excited about the guys who have been brought in already, and you mentioned a few of those guys. Uh, when it comes to the guards uh, specifically, in Aaron, in Marcus, and even a, a bit with AJ, though I assume he'll also play a bit on the wing. Yep. Um, you know what is it that each of them kind of stood out initially to you, or what about them initially stood out to you as uh as a coach and as a guy who has seen a lot of talent come through, obviously you've worked with Javon McClanahan, who was very, very nice here for the university of Hawaii, a, a multitude of guards throughout your career. What about those three specifically kind of stuck out to you? For, for Marcus, uh, something that hit me was his journey. Like he, he was at Sac state and, and, you know, coach left. So he decided to bet on himself and go Juco and, and then and bet on himself again and, and go to a, a, a program that really needed somebody to go and score. So like for, for me, I, I see that journey. I, you know, like I'd, I'd tried out for five different pro teams in Australia before I got my chance. And you, you can see the hunger there for him and, you know, the little chip on his shoulder. Um, he also has great leadership skills, which uh, something was apparent with Aaron Clater. As soon as you got to meet him, you know, po you know confident kid who 
you watch him play on the court. He's telling people where to go. So you, you feel like with those two guys on the floor, and, and we've still got Cody Williams come back to go into his junior year that plays point for us and was it was great last year. So with, with those guys, you feel like, um, for, for me personally, and that was the question that I, I have guys that I can talk to and that will do what we need to do offensively and, and we'll try and get better. And uh, AJ has just been a sponge since he, he got here. You know, he comes into a hard situation where he knows he's just coming to practice and, and get used to the routine and you talk to him, you know, he's great eye contact. And the next time you tell him to, to change something that he's doing, he's changed it. So you can see that those guys will really progress in their time here. And then I I wanted to split it into a couple. Talking about Tanner, what does he kind of bring to the table that is either the same or different comparatively to what Bo's fans may be used to with Bernardo da Silva patrolling the paint for you guys the last few seasons? What does he bring compared to Bernardo down low? The Two things uh, that he will bring is experience and with the big guys, and, and you could see it a lot with, and, and, and to bring up Moore's name, you know, like Moore said, the experience you have over time for the big kids, they, they just get better as they get older. And that that's part of the deal. So Tanner is a six year guy uh, that, that will end up, you know, playing and he's played a lot. So he has that experience and Bernardo had that for us as well. He was a really good passer and, and could he was never in the wrong position on offense. So you have some stability there and bringing him in uh, to that lineup will bring stability and, and some uh, veteran leadership, I guess is the best way to, to describe it. Need, need veteran leadership, especially because it feels like at this point, there's going to be a lot of young talent on your team that you guys feel need to take, or, or maybe from the outside feels like, to to go where you guys want to go needs to take that next step and it can help to have guys who are a little bit older a little bit more mature a little bit more uh seasoned in life per se to be on the roster because that even brings us back to marcus where you can have him there and you mentioned his journey and how he can talk to the guys like a cody williams who has seen the ups and downs through his first couple of years whether it be injuries or a, a glut of really talented guards in front of him in the rotation how to continue to attack and go about every single day uh, as a professional in a sense is that's kind of where we've shifted to in college athletics. Yeah, it, it, it's invaluable to have older guys on the team. You, you talk to guys that have been in college basketball for a long time. The, the one thing I got when I first got here is I'm trying to learn a little more about it. It was like you, you need to be old to be good and <laughs> you, you don't need to be really old. Um, and have everybody, but you, you do need experience and it really helps. And, and, and it also sets up the, the next group of guys coming through. Like we, we've got, you know, three or four guys there that we think are going to be all league players in the next few years. And you, you want them to learn from the right guys that do things the right way. And I know like how I, we mentioned earlier and with our couple of questions that we got in, uh, had to deal with kind of the spots that are open and we, you can't speak specifically on the players that are coming in, but could you share with us maybe a couple of the qualities that these players that you're hoping to get have and how they might contribute to the program if we do land them? One of the things we needed to replace, we, we had a, um, a couple of really good shooters, um, Juan Munoz and uh, Justin McCoy last year were some of the best shooters you, know, like you could get in college basketball, really. So uh, we need to re- needed to replace their shooting. Uh, and we also, you know, Noel was a, a great scorer for us, Noel Coleman. So we, we need one more person that can come in and, and still give us uh, a boost there in the scoring department plus, plus the shooting. So that's kind of someone that you guys are hoping to get potentially <laughs> and, and there's still a lot of players out there and there's different routes you can get whether it's the transfers or, or still the high school mm-hmm. players out there as well Well, and that's something that i was going to kind of bring up as well just for the matter of for our friend who sent in the the question about having five open spots this late in the cycle because i i'm sure i know a lot of fans would be stressed about that as well but we are kind of in an unprecedented time it seems like in terms of player availability because even now, you even with the portal quote unquote closed, right? You still have players who enter in should a coach leave, and then all of a sudden that resets a thirty day time cycle for for certain guys mm-hmm. and whatnot. I, I think we actually just saw that happen in conference somewhere, and I'll have to look it up during the break and see. But it, it's it's so interesting to see how 
player movement almost never stops at this point. And you also bring up something else where it, it seems like going back to the high school route might become important again for certain schools, certain places to still try and get into those untapped talent barrels. It, it, it's been interesting. Um, some of the high school kids have intentionally held out longer because they know that there's going to be spots open. Uh, and just to, to talk on the recruiting part of it again, I spoke to a friend who's at a very high major and they have a, a very high NIL uh, budget. And he was talking about they're having trouble getting somebody for a final spot. And the amount of money that he said that they had to offer somebody was like nearly knocked me over. <laughs> me. <But> me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, so, so it's not just us. That that's in this position that the highest of high major schools are in the same position and 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 it's a trickle down effect. The other thing that's just slowed us down in the last couple of weeks has been that um, the dead period. So you haven't been able to do visits. So yeah. mm-hmm. so you, you'll you'll see that ramp up again over the next week or so because t- people go on visits again and 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 finish that off. And we are joined in studio by UH men's basketball assistant coach Brad Davidson. Uh, if you guys have any questions about UH men's basketball or just for Brad in general, be sure to text us at 808 kgu one 808 But we do need to take our last break. So we'll be right back on the Hawaii Sports Radio Network. Wake up in the den with Kule Agbayani on the Hawaii Sports Radio Network, 95.1 FM and AM 760. Welcome back to Wake Up in the Den. Kule Agbayani, Paul Brecht, and joined in studio by UH Men's Basketball Assistant Coach Brad Davidson. We've got about 10 minutes left, so if you guys do have any questions, text us in at 808 kg one 808-888-5481. We will... Uh, finish up and continue with our discussion about the program itself um so tell us a little bit about what the uh, aside from trying to get in the last (laughs) few guys which we talked about as well uh what else uh, can what does the summer look like for the program and then heading into the fall when everything picks up again so the players arrive back here end of june um with the incoming guys will come in uh, kind of a week earlier than, than the um, guys that have been here before. We do an eight-week um, uh, summer session. Uh, that'll be mixed in with some camps. Yeah. Yes. So uh, a little bit of fun for the guys as well to get in and around the community. And then uh, we'll we'll take a, a trip to Kauai at, at one stage. And then, uh, yeah, we're just trying to get the guys back in uh, in shape and fit that that not everyone will be here um, unfortunately but uh, most of the guys will be here and they'll get a chance to just get on top of things before we we get into it when school starts all right I do want to go back to the text line Uh, someone texted in from the 721 do you feel any pressure question mark this year is a critical year for the program uh, not getting into postseason for eight seasons Yes, I think you feel pressure every year. I was, I was, <laughs> so I was thinking that, but I didn't want to answer for you. But when I read it, I was like, I feel like every year is pressure. I, I, th- I think it's it's really interesting because if you were in our locker room at the end of every season when you don't win it, uh, you would see how much it means to everybody that that you hadn't won it that year. And if you do win every year, you uh, you know, you know, uh, not many teams get to do that. You know, it's not one of those ones where you just get to win every year. It's great. Yeah. And obviously um, you, you want to win it and it's time for us to win it again. And we're doing everything we can just as we have every year um, to try and win the tournament and then uh, get back into the NCAA tournament, and try and win another game here. Like I've seen the videos of, of that and we play it to the guys. It's where we want to get. That's our goal every year. Yeah. And I do want to remind everyone, uh, we talked about this before where, uh, since Hawaii won uh, in EG's first season, I mean, there hasn't been many schools in the Big West that have won the Big West tournament. I mean, Irvine, who 
we always talk about being at the top of the conference consistently has only won once as well. So yep. I don't think people like obviously fans as they should have high expectations. They love the program so much. But when you take a step back, there's only been yeah, Irvine's only won it once. And I think Santa Barbara and Fullerton are the only schools that have won it twice. And I think there's only one other school that has won it since, again, that time Hawaii won. So it's not as we're not as far behind as it feels like. But I know we're hungry for a championship, but I wanted to remind everyone that we're not like down in the dumps. We could be like how Cal Poly was last year and not win any games. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, we've had nine straight winning series uh, mm-hmm. conference seasons, but that's not our goal either. Not, so, yeah. and the, one of the reasons why everyone goes crazy when you do win it is because it's so hard to do. Uh, my first year at North Dakota, we we won our conference tournament. We won in overtime. Huh. So the the margin for error, like last year we missed a, a shot on the buzzer that would have sent us to the oh. final. Yeah, yeah, the, the margin for error is so small. And we talk to the guys about this all the time as well. Like it, it, we're on you about everything because we need to save one more possession. We need to we need to make one more shot. We need to make one more free throw. That's why we're on you all the times because the, the margin for error is so small. Yeah, make your free throws, kids. That's something <laughs> I would say. <laughs> but that's something that a lot of people don't understand. And it's something that... At, I think you see at every level of basketball is how important those little things are. So it's funny to to actually hear it from coaches. But no, I'm glad you do bring up that point, Koo, because it, it really is hard to win a championship. And that's true at every single level uh, when when you do compete. And I, it's tough, right? Because I sit here and I hear the fans complaints or or concerns and it's hard because I don't think there's not that sense of urgency in in the locker room I I think I would argue there is that greater sense because you get so many competitors together at a time and it's one of those things where like you said you you've strung together nine winning seasons you don't get that type of winning culture without bringing in the right type of people who care about those little things and Part of that, I I would imagine, makes recruiting a little bit more difficult as well, where you have to look at things that are greater than just that eye test. You have to understand how people mesh together because you can have all the talent in the world. I mean, goodness gracious, the NBA is filled with very, very talented players and a lot of really bad teams because guys just don't mesh. So the, the magic elixir is not just, ooh, bring in any and every great name, right? Yeah, and Coach Gannat, you know, he does care a lot about the, and of course all the coaching staff too, but just the quality of the person. And you don't necessarily want a player that is only picking a school only because of the amount of money that they're going to get, right? Like once the players are like, oh, well, if that is the only question and their only focus, I mean, me as a fan, like, I don't want you here. I want you to be here because you want to play for the state. It's a very, very special place to play. And the entire you are literally playing for an entire state. You know, it's the only Division One program here, and that's kind of what has to be navigated, right? Where you could have a really, really good player, but and maybe we could offer them more than other schools. But like, is that who you want here? If all their main focus is just how much money am I going to get? It, it has been the talk of college basketball as well, like teams that have been good and and then had some money and then grabbed transfers from here, there, and everywhere, and then fell off the cliff. And it, it, it's, yeah, like you said, it's really happened with Arkansas. I think was it Arkansas? It's probably Kentucky. That's <laughs> yeah. part of why Cal moved Arkansas over. Arkansas had a, a, an issue with it. And that, you know, but that's a different um, level l- level. Yeah. And, and you, you're bringing in guys from, from different areas. So, but finding the right um, mix, as you said, of, of guys that want to do the right thing, but trying to find the, like you, you can't bring in all the same guys at the same position and you can't, you know, now you're getting to the point where is if you do have any NIL money, you have to make sure that that money is spread between the positions and the skill sets as well. So interesting. Like it really has been such a change. I had the only last question that I had was the differences uh, that you've seen in your time here coaching at the college level in in the united states where you've kind of seen different eras how uh how you've used those past lessons for now as you go forward i i got actually got asked this uh about a week ago uh the difference between pro basketball and and college basketball and different teams and age groups you know i 
I've, I've retired when I was 35, but I still had 18 year olds on our team that were coming through. So, so what was the difference? And, I, and my answer to that question is basketball is basketball. Te- teams are teams. It doesn't matter whether it's your family team, you know, wh- whether it's the, your group of friends, it, it's, it's all the same. So you've got to approach it the same way and, and live your values through that. And then just make sure that everyone's working for a common goal and that you've got to understand people in that as well. You, you need to know what everyone's uh, motivations are and, and hopefully you can find the, the lightning in a bottle, as we call it. All right. We got less than a minute left, but thank you, Brad, for taking the time to join us today and uh, remind everyone when is the first kids camp? Oh, it's the... Oh, ten- sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. 10th to the 14th? 10th to the 14th. 10th to the 13th. I believe we have it on our yeah. website if in not, case you want to see. You can check it out on our website. But we had so much fun today, and hopefully we have you on soon. So thank you very much for joining us. You'll get a different set of Tim Tams next time. Thank uh, you for having me. <laughs> that's exciting. I didn't know there I were know. different sets. <laughs> All right, but we got to go. You guys can listen to this episode on demand or watch on YouTube later. For Paul Brecht, Coach Davidson, I'm Kule Agbayani. Mahalo for listening. Bye. Your home for USC Trojans football, KGUAM, K236CR, Honolulu is the Hawaii Sports Radio Network on 95.1 FM and AM 760.